All right, guys. Happy Friday. For those of you who don't know me, yeah, I'm Magda. Um, so great news. This is going to be the last lecture that is in this room for your guys' noon conference, unless something changes. Um, but all of the subsequent noon lectures starting Monday are all going to be in the School of Medicine. So there's a really big auditorium there. So it'll be really exciting. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about rheumatologic emergencies. And we're going to start with a patient case. So this is a 36-year-old woman. She's brought into the emergency department by her family for mental status changes. Um, for the past two days, the family noticed uh, increased forgetfulness, confusion, alteration in personality. She has a five-year history um, of lupus, but she's mostly been um, managed on Plaquenil, um, without any issues. Her disease has previously been quiescent, um, but about a week ago, she developed some fatigue, diff a diffuse erythematous rash, polyarthritis. There's no history of focal deficits, seizures, or neck stiffness. Um, she does not have a fever. Her history is also significant for hypertension. Medications are low sartan, hydroxychloroquine, prednisone, five milligrams daily, daily multivitamin and physical exam. She's awake and alert, follows commands, but is not oriented to time and place. Um, vital signs are normal. Neural exam is normal other than the mental status changes. She has no motor or sensory deficits and the remainder of your exam is otherwise normal. Anything that anyone is suspicious for in this point in time. All right, how about if I give you some labs? So your ESR is 42, C3 and C4, so your complement levels are low. Your CRP is 0.2, creatinine is 1.4. You have a positive ANA with a one to 320 ratio. And a cerebral spinal fluid, fluid analysis shows a normal cell count, normal glucose and normal protein, or a slightly elevated protein at 85. How about now, any guesses? and give you some options. Oh, a little bit more. Her, she has a CT scan of her brain that's normal, um, an, MR, an MRI and an MR angiogram of the brain that has multiple punctate white matter changes in the periventricular areas. There's no evidence of vasculitis or blood vessel narrowing. So which one of the following do you think is more, most likely? An acute bacterial meningitis, neuropsychiatric systemic lupus erythematis, um, status epilepticus or a steroid induced psychosis? Who, who votes for A? B? Okay, C? What about D? No. B is correct. Um, so this is something that can happen um, in up to 75% of patients who have lupus. Um, and it can involve either the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. So you can have CNS manifestations, you can have uh, things like paresthesia as weakness as well. Um, the most common man manifestations of um, neuropsychiatric lupus are actually milder. Um, they are headache, cognitive dysfunction, mood disorders, depression, um, and those can be pretty vague. Um, acute presentations can present with seizures, psychosis. Um, if you have signs of active lupus, so low complement levels, so complement is a marker of, of disease activity um, in lupus. So if your complement levels are low, that means your disease is still active, um, as well as the double-stranded DNA that will also, um, that is also a marker of activity. Um, another clue is that you have elevated protein in your cerebral spinal fluid. Um, so usually what would you expect with bacterial meningitis? Would your glucose be high or low? This glucose was normal. Um, you will see diffuse white matter changes um, on um, MRI. Um, and you also don't have these classic symptoms of an acute bacterial men meningitis. So you don't have the neck stiffness, there's no fever. Um, why do you think it's not a seizure? She's talking to you, right? So it can't be status epileptic epilepticus. And do you think that she could have a steroid-induced psychosis? What would speak for or against it? Even if she was just on 
and prednisone five. So low dose, yeah. What do you know? What doses of um, of steroids do you, you typically would be concerned for a steroid induced psychosis? So it's usually with higher doses. So if you're in the 60s, you start to become more concerned when you ha have somebody on like high dose steroids of one milligram per kilogram of like methyl prednisolone daily. That's when you're concerned. Anything below 20 is very unlikely to cause that. So it's never lupus unless it's lupus. Um, so lupus is a multi-organ autoimmune disease. The presentations can range from um, mild symptoms to any, any organ can really be involved. Um, so you can have like 90% of patients will have arthritis, arthralgias, um, mucous membrane lesions, cutaneous lesions. Um, the most common things you see are, are this um, butterfly rash. So remember that's that a uh, rash that spares the nasolabial folds. Uh, and if you look at this bottom left picture, that is the photosensitivity rash that is associated with lupus. So this is something that will come up with, um, they'll say, I was just outside even on a cloudy day and I have this horrible rash. Um, and you can see it's in the photosensitive areas because everything that's covered by a shirt um, is not really affected. Um, Cardiac involvement can range from pericarditis. You can have uh, ligament sacs, which is your verrucous endocarditis, valvular insufficiencies, which can cause emboli that can lead to strokes. You have an increased risk of coronary artery disease in anybody who has lupus. And myocarditis will occur, but it's not as common. Pleuritis, pleural effusions are pretty common as well. Um, vasculitis can develop in about 10 to 40% of patients. Um, usually that comes in the form of palpable purpura. You'll see um, petechiae, levetal reticularis, paniculitis, splinter hemorrhages in the nails. Um, and then as far as thromboembolic disease, a lot of patients um, can present with a concurrent antiphospholipid syndrome. And so they're more likely to have DVT strokes, PEs. 50% of patients will have renal involvement. Um, that usually presents with proteinuria, hematuria, um, if it's bad, it can present with volume overload, and then you'll, you can have leukopenias, anemias, um, and then retinal vasculopathy. So on, on fundoscopy, you would see cotton wool spots and optic neuropathy, episcleritis, uh, scleritis, or even an anterior uveitis. The pathogenesis is actually unknown. It might be due to cerebral vascular endothelial dysfunction um, because of the inflammatory state and the increase in cytokines. You have immune complex, complex formation and microvasculopathy that disrupts the blood brain barrier. barrier. And this is what allows all of um, the cells, autoantibodies and cytokines to migrate into that area where they pre uh, otherwise would not be found. Um, a lot of these patients have the antiphospholipid antibodies, and so that can lead to um, emboli, which um, can cause stroke symptoms and strokes. Um, a lot of these earlier presentations of the neuropsychiatric manifestations are difficult to diagnose because they're very vague. They come in fatigue, um, some mild mental status changes, fogginess, forgetfulness. So they're less severe, but should clue you in that this may be going on. Um, Another more severe ma manifestation is myelitis. Um, it's rare, but it has a very high mortality um, and it can present as an acute um, or subacute uh, paraplegia or quadriplegia, quadriparesis. Um, they're usually bilateral, but they're not always symmetric findings. So just be aware of that. Um, you can have sensory impairments um, localized to the level um, of the spine that's being affected. And you can also have things like impairment of bowel and bladder function that can seem like a neurogenic bladder or bowel. Um, so labs that you wanna get, you wanna get your basic labs plus liver function tests, ammonia, cause you wanna rule out any other causes that could be contributing to this mental status, uh, UA, TSH, toxicology, blood cultures, and then uh, your cerebral spinal fluid studies and ANA complement levels and a double-stranded DNA. Um, Start with a CT head, follow up an MRI if it's warranted. This is an example of what an MRI um, in a patient with uh, uh, another term that is used, this is lupus cerebritis. Um, so these are the white matter changes on the paraventricular changes you can also see. Um, 
to treat this, you treat the lupus. You can use post-steroids, stero post steroids, immunosuppressive therapy. If their psychosis is particularly severe, um, antipsychotics. All right, let's move on to our next patient case. You have a 25 year old woman who's hospitalized with a four week history of swelling in her legs, weight gain, shortness of breath um, on exertion. On physical exam, her blood pressure is 142 over 96. The rest of her vital signs are normal. There's pitting edema in her lower extre extremities um, that extends to her knees. Your ESR is 68, uh, hematocrit is 38%. Uh, complements are low again, creatinine is one. Anti-Smith antibodies are positive. Anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies are positive. Um, your UA shows three plus protein, no red blood cells, no leukocytes, no casts. And then a 24 hour urine protein is 6,000 milligrams in 24 hours. So what additional study do you think would help you in the diagnosis of what's going on? Renal biopsy, Renal biopsy. good job. Um, so biopsy helps rule out microthrombotic diseases associated with antiphospholipid syndrome. These can mimic a glomerular nephritis, um, and they can help you distinguish um, if these symptoms are also from an ankyovasculitis, which can also cause massive proteinuria. Um, and then even though the serology suggests that you have lupus, uh, you need to, or uh, lupus nephritis, you would confirm um, with a biopsy. The biopsy also helps you prognosticate um, where their course is going to go. So it'll tell you what the class is and if they're, you can pr prognosticate if they're more likely to develop um, end stage renal disease. So, does anyone know the indications for getting a lupus or um, a renal biopsy if you see this kind of presentation? So if anybody shows up with increasing serum creatinine um, without an alternative diagnosis or alternative cost to explain this diagnosis, and it's specifically in patients with lupus, if you've confirmed proteinuria more than one gram in 24 hours, um, if you have proteinuria more than half a gram a day in addition to um, hematuria or cellular casts. So Lupus nephritis is something um, that's unique to lupus patients. And like we said, lupus is a multi-system disease. So this is what happens when it affects the kidneys. It's the pathogenesis is thought to be from immune complex deposition in the kidneys, complement activation that causes endothelial damage. And that endothelial damage leads to inflammation in the kidney. Um, usually you pick them, can pick this up on screening. So if you have a lupus patient you're following as an outpatient, you screen them um, every, probably every six months to a year. Um, looking at a UA um, and labs and looking for protein, um, a rise in creatinine, any changes in their GFR. Once they progress, they can present with nephrotic syndrome, hypertension, volume overload, shortness of breath like this patient. They can have rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, loss of renal function. Um, and these, these uh, patients can also, if they start developing sediment or cast or proteinuria, hematuria, that starts to become concerning. Um, a lot of these patients will progress um, to dialysis. And if you um, um, progress to dialysis, that's more common in people who are um, African-American, especially African-American males, Hispanic patients, patients of a lower socioeconomic status, poor medication um, compliance, patients who already have hypertension and diabetes. Um, and if you're failing to normalize your serum creatinine or you have a persistent serum creatinine um, greater than two, then you're more likely to um, progress to end stage renal disease. Um, and so renal biopsy really helps kind of nail down this diagnosis and figure out how to treat it. So back to our case. So it turns out this patient was recently diagnosed with lupus one year ago. She's been on Plaquenil with good response. Um, the renal biopsy comes back with a class five membranous lupus nephritis absent chronicity and mild activity. So how do you treat this? Did you use A, adalimumab, elimumab, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, or mycophenolamethacil? C, cyclophosphamide. Any other guesses? Methotrexate, okay. Mycophenolate. Good job. <laughs> so a wide variety of answers. So Michael finally is the most appropriate treatment. Um, and this is based off of the biopsy finding. So it's a class uh, five membranous lupus nephritis. So she's going to need more aggressive therapy um, because she's having, she's 25. So this is a pretty rapid deterioration of her kidney function, given she was just diagnosed a year ago. 
Um, the treatments of choice, oops, sorry, um, are mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, and azathioprine. The reason that mycophenolate is your top choice is because it has a, a lower side effect profile than uh, cyclophosphamide. If you fail that, then you would move on to cyclophosphamide or um, azathioprine. Um, Adalimumab is not effective in lupus nephritis. It actually can make it worse. Belimumab is not well studied in lupus treatment or lupus nephritis treatment. Um, it's usually started after they've failed a lot of other therapies, um, but there's not a lot of literature to support it. Support it. Um, and then cyclophosphamide is your second choice just because it uh, does have more side effects. Usually you use it if you really want to induce uh, remission. Methotrexate is not effective, um, and it can actually have worsening like methotrexate toxicity because of the renal dysfunction. So these are all your classes um, of lupus glomerular nephritis. Um, so these classes um, are from the International Society of Nephrology and Renal Pathology Society. Um, depending on how severe, so these are classes that are basically based off of the biopsy that um, you've done. Um, if it's cl class one, so minimal mesangial, you really don't have very many clinical manifestations. Once you get to class two, you can have microscopic hematuria, proteinuria. Rarely you could have hypertension. Three is focal. Um, that's when you start developing your hematuria, proteinuria, may or may not have hypertension, but you see decrease in your GFR. And that's when you start to see nephrotic syndrome. Class four is diffuse. Um, this is when you definitely have hematuria, proteinuria. You're frequently already developing a nephrotic syndrome. You'll see casts on urine, um, decreased GFR, hypertension is very common, um, hypocomplementemia, and elevated double-stranded DNA is also seen in this, these patients. Remember, those are your signs of active lupus. Once you get to five membranous, you have extensive proteinuria, minimal hematuria, um, and you have renal function abnormalities, and then six, advanced sclerosing. So that's when you have chronic kidney disease. So those kidneys have already fibrosed. So treatment, another reason that it is important to get these biopsies is because it really dictates your treatment. So if you have a class three or four, um, you start with pulse dose IV steroids for three days, followed by an oral steroid taper while treating them with uh, mycophenolate for six months. If you have a class five, you start with oral prednisone for six months and mycophenolate for six months. And some of these adjunctive therapies, so Plaquenil, the ACE and the R, the ACE inhibitor and the ARB are used for blood pressure control, statin therapy, and smoking cessation. All right, so now you have a 32-year-old woman who's evaluated in the emergency department. She has a two-day history of headache and vomiting. She was diagnosed with Raynaud phenomenon one year ago, GERD six months ago. Her only medication is omeprazole. Um, on physical exam, her temp is 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Blood pressure is 240 over 140. Pulse is 88. Rests are 16. Oxygen is 96% on room air. Physical exam is significant for uh, uh, digital pitting on the ends of the fingers, thick, thickening of the skin over the fingers and the dorsum of the hands, thickening and uh, poikilodermic changes over the skin of the anterior chest. And so that, that picture is a, a picture of poikilodermia. So that's some of the telangiectasias. And then you get patterns of uh, hyperpigmentation mixed with hypopigmentation, usually in some exposed areas. Hematocrit is 32%, your uh, platelet count is 75, creatinine is 1.5, your UA shows two plus protein, but no blood, and the peripheral blood smear shows diminished platelet numbers and schistocytes. So what are you suspicious for? Nice. Yes, so systemic sclerosis. So this is an autoimmune disease that is from diffuse fibrosis. Um, and sclerosis of the small and large vessels. It's also a multi-organ disease um, that can really affect any part of the body. This is another one, as many of our room diseases, that the pathogenesis is not completely understood, but it's thought to, it's thought to be that there's some sort of early immunologic event and that triggers vascular changes. And that results in a generation of like a population of fibrin, like very fibrinogenic fibroblasts. So if you can imagine fibroblasts that are just like really raring to go, um, and this causes increased collagen deposition. So that's where you get your fibrosis and sclerosis, which is the narrowing, specifically the sclerosis term for the narrowing of the vessels. So this presents with skin thickening, edema, hyperpigmentation. You can get hair loss, capillary changes. Um, if you look in this picture in the top left, that's Raynaud's phenomenon. So you um, 
we'll see that with they have increased spasticity of the the vessels and um, if they are in a cold environment um, <clears throat> or if they get stressed their fingers will turn white <clears throat> this bottom left picture is a more advanced scleroderma affecting the uh, skin and so you can see like how tight that skin looks you'll see that it's very shiny and if you pinch the skin you're in, in like all of us, when you pinch the skin, you should be able to grab a little skin there, have a little skin come up. It's very difficult to do in these patients. Um, <clears throat> more advanced, they start like losing their, they can lose their nails or like the very like tips of their fingers become very blunted. The bottom right is something that I always found very interesting. It's that decreased oral aperture. They have just a very, very small mouth opening where they have this pursed lip look to them all the time that kind of makes them look like they're angry, but they're not. It's just the a result from the fibrosis. And then part of that crust syndrome is the calcinosis, which is that top, um, that top right picture. You can see that on radiography. Um, you can also have uh, ulcerations of your DIP and PIP joints, cal uh, telangiectasias, um, calcinosis cutis, rainouts, arthritis, tendonitis, a lot of fatigue. Patients will have GERD, esophageal dys dysmotility, um, a lot of these patients develop ILD, pulmonary hypertension is common, arrhythmias, heart failure, uh, kidney disease, and neuromuscular involvement. CRAS specifically refers to patients who have systemic sclerosis, but it refers to the co a specific constellation of symptoms. So does anybody know what the CREST is? Let's see. Calcinosis. R is rain ounce. Very good. E. Yep, esophageal dysmotility, esophagitis. Um, S, scleroderma, and T. Excellent, you guys are so good. Okay, so this is scleroderma renal crisis, and this is an um, up, a very abrupt onset of hypertension. Sometimes you get these like really little old ladies where their baseline blood pressure is like 90, but their blood pressure goes up to 130, and technically that's still an okay blood pressure, but for them, that's hypertension. Um, you have acute kidney injury, a normal UA with uh, mild proteinuria, no cast. Um, it usually occurs in uh, patients with uh, diffuse cutaneous disease. So you can have uh, systemic sclerosis that's limited cutaneous or diffuse. Um, so usually those patients that have more involvement will present with this. And about 50% of patients who have scleroderma renal crisis will require dialysis. And this is usually something that happens if you're gonna have scleroderma renal crisis, it usually happens within the first five years of your presentation. Part of your workup that you wanna do is your basic labs, UA, peripheral blood smear to look for schistocytes, uh, platelets, a renin level, EKG. And then because these patients have a lot of um, pericardial effusions and pulmonary hypertension, you wanna get uh, an echo as well. So how would you treat this patient? All these questions, by the way, are board questions. So they're all questions you're gonna be asked at some point. Who says A? Okay, B? No takers for B? Okay, okay, we've got a B, C. Steroids, that's all we do, right? We're rheumatologists, we give, just give people steroids. Um, nitroprusside, really take care of that blood pressure. Anyone? No? So it's actually captopril. Um, so first line treatment is uh, ACE inhibitors. So captopril, enalapril. ARBs are not uh, studied to be as effective. Calcium channel block blockers can be added on as a second line therapy. Um, endothelin receptor agonists have also been tried. The goal is to decrease the blood pressure by 20 in the first 24 hours. Um, but you obviously in patient whose blood pressure is 240, you might go below that. Um, and the ACE inhibitor after their first crisis, it should be continued indefinitely. There's not actually any research to show that these uh, patients uh, should be treated prophylactically with ACE inhibitors that actually um, could mask developing hypertension that would clue you in that they're having a scleroderma renal crisis. And there were no changes in mortality if they were prophylactically treated. So acute ischemic crisis. Um, Reynolds phenomenon is something that can happen in the general population or something that is specific to somebody with a rheumatologic disease. So if you have primary um, Reynolds phenomenon, it's just um, increased spasticity, increased sympathetic tone of the vessels, um, usually in the digits. Um, that just causes vasospasm, decreased blood flow. It's usually a response to colder stress. Um, it can also be caused by underlying vascular disease or impaired endothelial function, 
intimal proliferation, endothelial dysfunction, which is something that we see a lot in patients who have an underlying rheumatologic uh, disease. So if they have an underlying rheumatologic disease that can be contributing to their renounce, then it's a secondary renounce phenomenon. But if you get a really severe presentation, you can get critical digit ischemia. It can lead to uh, necrosis. So how do you treat this? Calcium geranial blockers, prostacyclin inhibitors, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Um, you want to keep the digits away from the cold if, they're, if it's really that severe. Um, treat their pain. So a lot of these people, because they have an increased sympathetic tone, if they're in a lot of pain, um, if they're really worked up, uh, it becomes harder to treat because a sympathetic tone is there. Digital lidocaine blocks are a way to chemically decrease your sympathetic tone. Um, usually if the digit has necrosis, unless there's a severe infection um, or they're in intractable pain, you use, just allow them to auto amputate. And then another option in someone who is very severe um, or has refractory disease is a surgical uh, sympath sympathectomy. Um, and so this is something that involves stripping the arteries of their adventitia um, and it decreases the sympathetic tone to prevent that spasm. Um, Caution with starting prostaglandins, especially if you know that someone has an underlying like scleroderma, um, because a lot of these patients have underlying pulmonary hypertension, you can actually cause circulatory collapse if you start these medications in these patients. So always get an echo first. Um, this would be a situation that you would get an emergent echo. All right, so you, now you have a 75 year old man who has a two month history of progressive malaise, weakness, aching bilateral shoulder pain, pain in the hips, two hours of morning stiffness, prolonged stiffness after immobility. Um, he recently noticed aching in his jaw when chewing. Uh, now he has left-sided headaches and now he's in the ED because he has vision changes in his left eye. Physical exam is significant for normal vital signs, tenderness and swelling over his left temple, uh, painful and limited range of motion in both hips and shoulders. Um, and, but the remainder of the exam is otherwise unremarkable and you have an ESR that's 85. So what is the next step? Do you want to get CT's head? What about low dose aspirin? Oral prednisone? I see some head nods, but no hand raises. You got to commit. <laughs> what about IV methylprednisolone? Okay, more hands there. Temporal artery biopsy? No one, good. You would start IV methylprednisolone. With starting that, are you concerned that you're going to mess up a biopsy? No. What's your window? So what do you think this is? Yeah, the GCA. So in GCA, if you want to get a biopsy, as long as you're within the first 14 days of steroids, you can, they'll still show up on biopsy. So never delay the steroids. Um, if you have somebody who has changes in their vision, acute vision loss, any sort of threat to their vision, do not delay steroids because that vision loss could be permanent. You, does anyone know the dose of methylprednisolone that you start with? Whatever high dose would be. <laughs> so one gram, um, one, one gram daily for three days. Um, and then you start low dose aspirin. So 81 milligrams a day. A day. Um, and that should be, the aspirin should be started in all GCA patients just to reduce any cardiovascular events. And it actually has some effect on reducing um, blindness. So the high dose therapy, usually you do that for about a month um, or at least until the ESR and CRP normalize and you will be on a long-term taper if it's confirmed GCA, especially, or you have a high suspicion for GCA, these people will be on tapers for anywhere from six months to a year. So the pathogenesis again, from why rheumatology is so interesting. A lot of these things we just don't know, um, but the pathogenesis for this is a little bit clearer. So it, there is an unknown trigger and for whatever reason, something causes lymphocytic proliferation in the adventitia and the elastic, elastic lamina of your arteries. Dendritic cells become activated and I'm taking you back a little bit more into uh, the nuts and bolts of immunology. Um, and they present to T cells and that causes T cell activation. And then you have uh, vascular inflammation, granuloma formation. So that's what you see on that biopsy. Luminar, luminal int, um, intimal proliferation. That's what causes the thickening and the narrowing of the lumen. Um, that's why you feel those pulsating arteries. And really you get this jaw claudication, vision changes. People will say, oh, I was brushing my hair. My scalp is really sensitive. 
um, a lot of temporal pain, headaches. Um, and then these pain in the shoulders and hips are actually signs of PMR. Um, so a lot of patients up to 50% with GCA will present with PMR either within being right before being diagnosed with GCA or within the time course of their GCA. When you work these people up, you just want to get basic labs, ESR, CRP, CT head um, to rule out any stroke if they're having sudden vision loss. You also want to make sure um, that this is not because they're having a thrombotic event. Um, an MRI may be warranted too to uh, rule out a stroke. Um, and then always call OPSO. OPSO can actually see signs of a GCA on their exam. So if you don't have vision changes, you, um, or if you do vision changes or any vision loss, pulse dose IV steroids. If no vision changes, you can start with just high dose prednisone, but do not delay steroids because you can have, um, you can have irreversible uh, vision, vision loss. Tocilizumab is another um, option. It's usually reserved for refractory or recurrent disease. Um, Actemra is actually now recommended um, to be started first line with steroids for GCA. And these are guidelines that were updated um, in, in 2019. Um, it's used to be just for refractory or recurrent disease, but now we're seeing it more, oops, sorry. Um, but um, also sometimes methotrexate is used, especially if insurance won't uh, improve the um, Actemra if there is a contra uh, contraindication to that. Um, so this is something that's going to show up on your, on your boards a lot. So catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome is not something that I've seen personally, but I think would be very scary to see. Um, so it's a severe form of antiphospholipid syndrome where a patient will have just mass thrombosis of multiple small vessels um, and multi-organ failure. Usually they come in with cardiopulmonary symptoms, um, acute respiratory distress just from um, alveolar hemorrhage. CNS pathology, abdominal pain, renal failure. Um, they have a lot of cutaneous symptoms. So you'll see like necrosis, um, thrombocytopenia and hem um, hemolytic anemia, um, infarction of the skin, abnormal neural exams that can kind of mimic a stroke, um, digital ischemia, gangrene, lots of DVTs and some will present with heart murmurs as well. Um, when you see this, you do want to keep DIC hit um, and other microangiopathies like TMA on your differential. So when you see these patients, and this right picture um, is a picture of Le Levito reticularis, which is um, also very common, and you can see some of those skin ulcerations. Um, so you want to get your basic labs, peripheral blood smear, coags, fibrinogen level, um, liver function tests, a Coombs test, anti-beta-2 um, beta uh, glycoprotein, anti-cardiolipin, and lupus anticoagulant. Um, if you're having neurosymptoms, CT, MRI is appropriate to, um, to evaluate those patients with neurosymptoms. Um, one thing that will clue you in that this is actually CAPS is uh, fibrinogen is usually normal in CAPS patients as opposed to DIC. Uh, the options of schistocytes helps you to differentiate from help TTPS and HUS. Um, so always get a peripheral blood smear because that can actually help you decide what is actually going on. Um, you treat this with unfractionated heparin. It's first line, um, high dose IV methylprednisone followed by uh, prednisone taper uh, as well. Um, Plasmapheresis is second line, and usually you do plasmapheresis followed by IVIG, and then third line would be cyclophosphamide um, and rituximab, which is more effective in patients who have lupus. Um, just, just the way that these people present, they're very, they get very sick very fast. Um, a lot of times they are uh, in the ICU. It has a pretty high mortality. So if you have somebody who has a rheumatologic condition who you're suspicious could have an antiphospholipid uh, syndrome, that is something that a lot of times, even if they don't have a formal diagnosis, this is gonna come up if you do a very good history. All right, so do you have any questions about anything? The last thing that I wanna say is just a word on steroids. I think that a lot of times uh, people just think, you know, oh, rheumatology, we're just gonna throw steroids at everybody. Um, we do consider very seriously whether or not to give somebody steroids, especially when you have patients that are on long-term term steroids, like your GCA patients, there's a lot of complications with steroids. Um, skin thinning, 
predisposed to infections. Um, these are patients that are, if, if you're on long-term steroids, you need to be started on uh, prophylactic medication for things like PJP. Um, just because of how, how much immune suppression you can get, you have pe peptic ulcers. Um, so if you're starting somebody on steroids, make sure that you are starting them on a PPI um, as well. And then hyperglycemia is a really big one. Um, so you start steroids and patients will, if they're on inpatient, it's a lot easier to treat um, because you just have them on sliding scale. Um, but it's something that you have to watch out for. Um, even patients who have no history of diabetes and otherwise have normal blood sugars at home will develop very high blood sugars. Um, you can um, also have um, adrenal atrophy. Um, so patients, if you have somebody who is on high dose steroids or sometimes just low dose steroids, but for a prolonged time, um, you have to start thinking that if they're sick in the hospital, hypotensive, then maybe they need some stress dose steroids. You get poor wound healing, which contributes to your infections. Myopathy is another big one. A lot of patients will show up with weakness, purpura. Um, and these patients who have GCA and are on steroids for a very long time, or patients who are even on low dose steroids, um, as an outpatient for a very long time, you worry about osteoporosis um, and um, as well as um, avascular necrosis of your femoral heads. Um, so, and then a lot of weight gain, which contributes um, to your diabetes as well. You can have vision changes with cataracts, glaucoma. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of side effects with steroids. So we are judicious about them. That is it for me. Um, do you guys have any questions about anything? I don't think I see any questions in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Oh no, that's a minimum. Like you want to go down by at least 20. Yeah, you can go more than that. You want to normalize their blood pressure. Um, but if you are not, oh, if you don't know what the chronicity of this blood pressure is, then you want to go slowly. So it's kind of similar to your hypertensive emergency patients. Usually these patients will have um, a rapid increase in their blood pressure. So it's not something that's been chronic. It's something that's, um, when they're presenting like this, it's more acute. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys so much. Happy Friday.